I'm Ellie Sparks. I'm the Director of Field Development. Welcome to Citizens Climate Lobby. I'm here with Mark Reynolds, our Executive Director, and we are going to tell you about Citizens Climate Lobby. We're going to let you know a little bit about our history, our mission and methodology, and our legislative proposal. And so again, welcome. I'm going to ask Mark to tell us a little bit about our founder and how we got started. Mark? Yeah, so our founder's name is Marshall Saunders, and he had spent 20 years prior to starting Citizens Climate Lobby setting up microcredit loans in third world countries. And I think people have probably heard of Muhammad Yunus, maybe some people have heard of microcredit, but that's where you lend money to the poorest of the poor people in the world. They start small businesses in their community, and then that lifts their family up out of poverty. 98% of microcredit loans are repaid, and so that actually sets up the next uh, group of loans in the community. So once you start the process, it's actually been this remarkable tool in alleviating extreme poverty. So that had really been what Marshall planned to do and the emphasis of his life for quite a while was trying to help as many people lift themselves up out of poverty as possible. Then when he saw what was happening with climate change, he realized that there was a very good chance that 20 years of work helping people help themselves was going to be undone by climate change. And he realized that he needed to throw himself at climate the same way he'd thrown himself at poverty. And one of the things that he brought on, the, the, the used from the climate issue, is he'd been working in partnership with an organization called Results. And what Results proved is if you organize people by congressional district and you actually gave them effective training, you could get really interesting things done. So 35 years ago, results started asking the US Congress to appropriate money to alleviate worldwide poverty. At that point, we were giving about $25 million a year. We've been giving over a half a billion for quite some time and two billion a couple of years ago. When you talk to members of Congress during these difficult budget times, how does that money stay protected? They'll tell you it's because um, the results volunteers are so effective and that their support is actually back home in the district where it needs to be. So Marshall didn't originally plan on working on climate, but he realized that it absolutely was work that had to be done to protect this work that had helped all these extremely poor people. I was going to talk a little about our mission and we'll talk about our structure and our legislative proposal in a few minutes. All right. So when Marshall started Citizens Climate Lobby, he gave us a two part mission. The first part you can probably guess, and that's to build the political will for a livable world. And in Citizens Climate Lobby, we believe politicians don't create political will, they respond to it. And so it is our job to build the political will for a livable world. Now, the second part of our mission is to empower people to have breakthroughs in personal and political power. I'll mm -hmm. say that again. To empower people to have breakthroughs in personal and political power. This is the part of the mission that moves the ball down the field closer to our touchdown. And I want to share a story with you about one of our volunteers and what this piece of the mission looked like for him. So about two and a half years ago, we had no groups in West Virginia. And on one of our weekly introductory phone calls, a fella came on, Jim Probst, to listen and learn about us. And when I discovered he was from West Virginia, I was so excited. I'd been wanting to have us start a chapter there for a good two or three years. And here finally was maybe someone who could help us with that work. Now, Jim is a furniture maker. He's a grandfather. He was one of those folks who moved back to the land in the 70s and lived a small carbon footprint kind of a life. And about three years ago, Jim was thinking about the climate crisis. He was worried about the future for his grandchildren. He went out and got trained as a climate reality project presenter came back to West Virginia and was stumped. How in the world was he gonna to talk to people in coal country about climate change, about the fact that we needed to stop burning coal? It just seemed like a, an impossible task. Now, it was shortly after that that he found Citizens Climate Lobby and like I said, landed on an introductory phone call like this, learned about us, and I spoke to him about starting a group. He was not sure still how in the world was he gonna to talk to people in coal country about the climate. So he decided to come and check us out. He came to one of our regional conferences. We had that year in Atlanta, Georgia, drove all the way down from Charleston, West Virginia, went to some of our workshops, learned a little bit about how we were organized and what our policy was about and really decided he would like what, we what we were about and the way we worked and that we would in fact be a good fit for him. 
So he went back to Charleston. He rounded up 12 other volunteers. Mm -hmm. Two months later, I went out, led a group start workshop, something to help organize and train his volunteers. And that very same day, Jim and I went to speak with the editorial page editors of one of the two mm -hmm. Charleston, West Virginia papers. And that started a snowball effect for Jim. He started writing letters to the editor and the paper started publishing them. He started writing op-eds, the paper started publishing those. The next thing we know, Jim comes to our national conference and meets with the entire West Virginia delegation. So all three house members, both senators. He goes back to West Virginia completely it charged up by the experience at the conference and promises to bring more West Virginians to the conference next year. During that first year, he had 13 meetings with the West Virginia congressional delegation. So twice in D.C. he met, and then throughout the year, back in the district. Again, that second year, he had another 10 meetings. Over two years, he had 23 meetings with the West Virginia congressional delegation. Four of those meetings face-to-face, -face, two with one mm -hmm. senator, two with a House member. Brought back six West Virginia volunteers to that next conference, and now has six chapters in West Virginia of people doing that same level of work as Jim is doing. So that was Jim's breakthrough, originally thinking there was nothing to be done in coal country and winding up two years later with six chapters, twice as many chapters as we have congressional districts, so many meetings, 23 meetings with members of Congress, countless letters to the editor and op-eds. And, you know, that's a lot. He's a furniture maker. He's a grandfather, back to the lander guy. What in the world happened to Jim that he could be able to do this? Well, there's a specific methodology that we use. And I want Mark to start us off describing that. It's that methodology that gives volunteers like Jim the capability and the capacity to do this work. Great. And as Ellie said, um, one of our fundamental starting points is, is that in general, politicians don't create political will, they respond to it. So if you know a specific way of generating political will, then we've got a chance of making the politics in an, in an inevitability and walk you through that. I want to go back to 2009 for just one moment. 2009 was the last time we got close to passing uh, legislation that had a price on carbon. The House passed Waxman Markey. After we, we failed to get something through the Senate, there was a political scientist at Harvard named Theda Scotchpole. She wrote over a hundred page criticism of why we failed. And at the heart of her criticism of her paper was that all the support for legislation was in the beltway and it needed to be back home in the district. So that's what we've been doing. We organize people by congressional district. So essentially their member of Congress has to see them. Once we have that group organized, at the heart of our structure is the second Saturday of every month we have a call and we do three things. Well, we do four things. We educate ourselves, we inspire ourselves, we get focused and we get into action and we practice talking. I want to talk about the education piece for just a moment because every month we want to feel like we're a little bit broader on the topic. So we've had the best climate scientists in the world on the call. Dr. James Hansen has been on a few times. We've had people who are glaciologists, people who study ocean acidification. We've had a lot of really top-notch economists on the call. And the economists all say the same thing. If you want less of something and you want that hat to happen quickly, the fastest way to do so is to make it more expensive. And they all point to cigarette smoking. You know, over half of Americans used to smoke. Now that's less than 20%. And economists will say, sure, education contributed, but price was the most important factor. So, and again, as I said, every month we try and get at it a different, a different way. One of our really breakthrough calls, in 2011, Rob Willer published a paper called Apocalypse Soon, Dire Messages Are Counterproductive in Global Warming. And what his study showed is that if the only thing you do is give people all the problems, all the dire warnings about global warming, it actually hurts more than it helps. That was a breakthrough for us because we've been doing what a lot of people are doing. I've been telling people how terrible things were going to be and people would shake their head at me and I would think, what is wrong with my friends? They don't seem to understand anything. Once Rob Willer said we need to focus on solutions, it changed the dynamic of our organization. And you can give people all the problems you want. You just have to lead and finish with solutions. Another gentleman from the same school, Mark Jacobson from Stanford, is one of the people who's written peer-reviewed pieces that show how we can get all the world's electricity from renewable sources. So, uh, you know, it's great for you and I to go around and say clean energy is better than dirty energy. It's important that people with large scientific credentials have mapped all the places in the world that's viable so we know there's enough sources that it can be done. So we've had Mark Jacobson on. 
My favorite speaker though is Catherine Hayhoe. She was on again this month. And the first time Catherine was on, we saw, well, here's this climate scientist and she's evangelical. That sounded really interesting to us. So we brought her on the call. And uh, the first call she was on with us, she didn't talk about science. She's had a lot of science talks with us, but here's what she talked to us about. She said, you know, every major religion tells people that we should be good stewards of the planet. And everybody knows we're not doing that. So if you're willing to appeal to people based on their faith, rather than just the science, there's all these people that want to help, that will help if you let them come to this issue based on their faith. That was shocking from, to me. I thought the only valid way that someone would want to work on global warming, climate change, is as if they came to it through the science. But Catherine Hayha said, no, meet people on their own terms. That was a remarkable, I think, moment for me and for the whole organization where we realized what we wanted to do was find out what brought people to this issue and how we could talk to them about that and let them participate with us. So the first half of our call is educational. Then we have short talks called laser talks. We have about 40 laser talks on our website. So if somebody says to you, well, what if the US does something and China doesn't do anything? You have well-referenced short talking points so that you can continue to move conversations along. How does this compare to what the uh, administration is doing with the clean power plan? Again, every month we have a short talk so that people have a chance to not only understand the issue better, but also be able to express themselves also. Um, and then the third thing we, we actually ask people to do is, is to practice those talks so that it's not just you have talking points, but you've taken time to rehearse them and then we get into action. So there may be times where we're asking everybody to go meet with their member of Congress or sometimes we're asking everybody to get something published in their paper. Last year we had over 1,200 meetings with congressional offices. We had over 3,000 letters to the editor published so that when you're doing something collective, it amplifies the impact rather than just doing things one at a time. Ellie's also gonna talk about one piece of the call also, which is what we call the inspirational part of it. So I'll turn it back over to Ellie for a second. Right, so um, after we educate ourselves, we get inspired and this is where we hear reports from the field. So we hear from volunteers on specific actions they're taking. We hear collectively about our impact. And so, for example, when I started out as a volunteer in 2010, at the end of that first year with 46 chapters, we um, had gotten published across the US and Canada a total of 181 letters to the editor, and we were thrilled with that number. Now, last year, we ended the year with 3,574 pieces of published media. So in addition to letters to the editor, we had op-eds, we had editorial articles, so the editors of the paper calling for climate solutions and carbon fee and dividend, our proposal. And that number is huge. I love that. So when I know that when my letter gets published in my local paper that very same day, 10 or 15 other letters to the editor are being published in newspapers across the continent. So my voice mm -hmm. is echoing. I don't feel like I'm the only one at the party talking about climate solutions anymore. And uh, we also celebrate the numbers of meetings, for example, that we've had with members of Congress. So far this year with uh, members of Congress and Parliament, we've had 1,288 meetings. So these meetings, as you can uh, surmise, are not one-time meetings. We're meeting again and again, over and over again with our members of Congress in DC, back in the district. We're building relationships with our members of Congress. Now, the fun thing to hear is some specific actions that have been taken in our progress. In 2015, we had a group of volunteers working with a member of Congress quietly in upstate New York, Chris Gibson, a Republican, to see if he might come out with a resolution that would say climate change is real and man-made and Congress needs to lead. So he and they worked quietly finding 10 other Republicans and he came out with the Gibson resolution in September of 2015. Since then, we've gotten another six members of Congress, all Republicans as well. So 16 Republicans saying climate change is real. We need to do something about it. And then in February of 2016, some of our volunteers down in Florida worked with two members of Congress down there, a Republican, uh, Carlos Curbelo, and the Democrat, Ted Deutsch, and they formed the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus, which now has 20 members, although with the election, things have shifted a bit. 
but still Republicans and Democrats. You, if you're a Republican and you want to join the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus, you have to go find a Democrat to join with you and vice versa. So we get inspired and those, what we're hearing about other volunteers doing these kinds of actions inspire us to continue working in our own area with our own members of Congress. Um, so also what we practice, I'll tell you one other thing, we practice talking, those laser talks, like Marcus said, describing the problem and the solutions. We also practice listening. We found that if we steamroll through a meeting, assuming people are understanding what we're saying, sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. And so we practice asking questions, we look for values, we dig below the surface comments that sometimes might feel a little abrasive and look for the underlying uh, message that we can respond to. And that always takes the conversation further and deeper and, uh, and allows us to build more intimate relationships with our members of Congress. So um, when, Mark, do you want to say anything about taking actions every month? I, that's one of the things I love about CCL is that every single month we're in a state of action. Yeah, I think that that's really one of the most important things as part of the organization because there's lots of things that we can do that are one-offs. You know, sometimes we'll go to a march or, you know, we'll attend a rally or something. Um, and we know we need a sustained effort. And so one of the really nice things is the second Saturday of the month, we all get together and we all take action together. So you know if the action that month is writing a letter to your member of the House and your two senators, you know that thousands of people will be doing it with you around the country. And we know that when, the, when people do that, again, it amplifies the impact. So it's important that not just we're educating ourselves, not just we're getting more articulate, but we're also making sure that we're, we're doing something. Um, and then Ellie, why don't you talk about a little bit of training support, and then I think what people are really interested in is our legislative proposal. Terrific. Yeah, so if we ask you to write a letter to the member of Congress or meet with an editorial page editor or uh, go do some outreach, we will provide training for you. We've got a website, we've got video conferencing that we do training on. So you, you will be well prepared. Your group of volunteers working with you will be prepared. Anything we ask you to do, you will get training and support in doing that. So uh, yeah. Our legislative proposal, the carbon fee and dividend, here's how it is. I see it as a three-legged stool. The first leg is a fee placed on fossil fuel. It's a steadily rising fee. We start the fee low so we don't shock the economy. It steadily, predictably rises every year and continues rising until we've solved the problem. We set the pace at which the fee rises so that within roughly a decade, the price of fossil fuel becomes more expensive than the price of low carbon energy. We recommend starting the fee at $15 per ton of fossil fuel of carbon dioxide that gets emitted when the fossil fuel is burned. So the good thing about carbon dioxide is that we know exactly how much comes out of any particular fossil fuel when we burn it. We don't have to go chasing down tailpipes and measuring smokestacks. We can assess the fee far up at the wholesale market when the fuel enters the US economy, so at the coal mine, the fracking site, the oil well, or when ships come into the port of entry laden with fuel. So we start that fee of $15 per ton, it goes up $10 per ton every year and continues rising. Now this start low, steadily rising fee does a couple of things. Number one, it sends a price signal to investors who see a point in time in which their investment in fossil fuel becomes unwise and an investment in low carbon energy becomes a better bet. So they will begin shifting their investments from high carbon to low carbon energy. The second thing the steadily rising fee does is it provides predictability for businesses, state governments, localities, school systems, hospital systems, university, any entity, large or small, that needs to look at what they're doing now, investigate their current practices, look at what others in their industry are doing as far as low carbon transition, try some of those things out, build a plan, implement the plan. It gives them a decade or two to make that transition. So that's the first leg, start low, steadily rising fee. The second leg answers the question, what do we do with the money once we've collected it? Now, we could do a couple of things and people have ideas. We could pay down the national debt. We could invest in research and development. We could invest in infrastructure, great ideas. Mm. We say, instead, return that revenue evenly to households. Every adult gets one share. 
every child gets half a share up to two children per household. Now this does a couple of things. Number one, it lets our Republican friends in Congress who have signed Grover Norquist's No New Taxes Pledge to be supportive of carbon fee and dividend. All of the money that comes in goes right back out. It is revenue neutral. We are not growing the size of government. Now the second thing this dividend does is that it uh, rewards the carbon virtuous among us. <laughs> so people who have a small carbon footprint, we're all going to see a cost of living increase with that fee that gets passed along down through the economy. But if you have a small carbon footprint, the dollar amount of that increase will still be small. And so you get that dividend check each month, your cost of living will be less than the amount you get in the dividend check, you'll have some pocket change. Now the interesting thing about being carbon virtuous is that for the most part, if you are poor or middle income, you are carbon virtuous simply because you don't have enough money to ha have a big carbon footprint. So for the most part, the dividend protects the poor and middle income people during this transition time from high carbon to low carbon energy. So that's that second leg, that dividend returned evenly to households. The third leg uh, answers the question, what about our trading partners and the global playing field for our businesses? So here's what the third leg is. It's a border adjustment. So this says goods coming into the US from countries that are not pricing carbon will be assessed a tariff at the border. And goods from the US going to countries that are not pricing carbon will be rebated at the border as well for that hmm. fee. And so this maintains a level global playing field for our businesses as they trade abroad or trade within our borders. And it also inspires our trading partners to set up their own carbon pricing programs. There is not a country in the world that would rather have their businesses pay a tariff to the U.S. when instead they could collect a fee or tax on their home turf. So that's a third leg, that border adjustment. So we've got the fee, start low, steadily rise. We have the dividend going evenly to households, and we have the border adjustment. So... Mark, would you like to wrap up for us and... and uh, well, can I ask you a couple of questions? Yep. Do you meet with both Republicans and Democrats and you could say anything about how those meetings go? Yes, we do. So for example, when we have our national conference, for the past three years, we have had over 500 meetings on Capitol Hill. So now there's 535 congressional offices. If we're meeting with 500 or more offices, then we are certainly meeting with both Democrats and Republicans. And we are building relationships with both folks. We are not doing some kind of figuring out which one we should go to better. We're, we're making our request to every single member of Congress. We've got groups in all but 80 of our congressional districts. So we're very serious about speaking to both Democrats and Republicans. And there are values that both Democrats and Republicans hold that can bring them to the table around climate solutions. Great. And what do you feel the prospects are for getting your legislation passed? Our aim is to pass this in 2017. The fortunate thing about the way elections turned out is we've got a Republican president and Republican House and a Republican Senate. And we have been working since our founding in reaching out to Republicans. So we have great relationships with Republican offices. And we are excited about the prospect of getting this passed in 2017. Okay. Do you want to give people your contact information in case they want someone to follow up with them? Sure. So <laughs> my name is Ellie, E-L-L-I. Last name is Sparks, like a firecracker, makes a lot of sparks. My phone number is 804-475-6775. And my email address is ellie at citizensclimate.org. And when you registered to listen to this call or listen, watch this video, we were able to collect your phone number and your information and your email address. So you will be getting an email from our membership coordinator, Brianna Smith. She will be introducing you to the local organizer, might be a group leader, might be a state or regional coordinator. I want you to reach out to that person if you're interested make a connection, let them know what you're interested in doing, share a little bit about your skills and talents with them, ask them what do they need right now in your state or your city. 
and they'll let you know. It might be they need help at an outreach event. It might be they need someone to host uh, something in their home or some people to write some letters to members of Congress. So they will let you know what they need and then you can work with them on doing that, doing some of those tasks, taking action, getting started right away. Yeah, and that's the last thing I'd say. The most important thing is for people to be in action. That's That counts more than anything else. And uh, we're very grateful that you'd be in action to listen on this call. And if you would like some support from us and how to develop a great relationship with your member of Congress, how to generate uh, political support, I mean, political will out there in the public, we would be, be love to help you uh, do that. And if the only thing you ever touch us with is, is being on this call, thank you so much for that. I just don't think people ever come to this call unless they have a very big commitment to the planet. So thank you for having that big commitment already. And we look forward to working with you if we get a chance.